Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Jesse Lund, and I would like to personally welcome you all to the first electric truck boot camp. This is the first of 10 of an educational series on electric trucks that we are hosting between now and late August in the run up to Run on Less Electric. The electric truck boot camp is hosted by NACFI and RMI. And like I said, this is part of the lead up to Run on Less Electric, an electric truck technology demonstration, which will take place this September. Run on Less Electric will be kicking off at the ACT Expo. And if you would like to join us at ACT, there is a discount code here on the screen that you're welcome to use as you register. Before we jump in today, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Peterbilt. Peterbilt is an event level run on less electric sponsor and the sponsor of today's electric truck boot camp session. So a huge thank you to Peterbilt for supporting this educational series. Next, just a quick reminder that these electric truck boot camp trainings will be happening every two weeks at this time. So our next training will be in two weeks on May 4th and we'll be starting a two part session on charging. So in two weeks, we'll be talking about how to think about planning and building out charging to support electric trucks. And before we jump in, I also wanna give a quick reminder that if you are interested in testing your knowledge of all of the content we're about to cover today, we have built out a learning system on the Run On Less website, runonless.com, where you can go take 30 seconds to create a quick login and then take a quick quiz on each of these electric truck boot camp trainings. So after today's session, you'll be able to go in and test your knowledge of our topic today, what is driving electric trucks. And before we start there, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items real quick. The first is that we will be doing a question and answer session with our speakers at the end of the webinar today. If you have any questions that you weren't able to submit when you registered, please use the Q&A box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to submit those. We likely won't get to all questions today, but we will be able to follow up with folks afterwards. So feel free to enter your questions in that Q&A box. There will also be a quick 30-second survey shown at the end. We'll give the link then. And yes, recordings of the session, as well as a copy of the slides from today's presentations will be available afterward. So feel free to sit back, enjoy and take it all in and not worry about taking too many notes. If you do experience any technical issues, got some contact info up here. You can also feel free to put some info in the chat. And with that, I'm gonna dive into our topic today. We are kicking off this electric truck boot camp series by talking through what is driving electric trucks. You can see from this slide here, we have seen a huge surge in interest in electric trucks. This is showing the search history for the term electric trucks. And for those of you in the industry, I know sometimes it can feel like almost every day there's a new announcement, um, press release, policy being announced having to do with electric trucks. We are certainly seeing this taking off as a hot topic. And so today we're hoping to talk about why that is. We've seen from some experts in the field that electric truck sales are expected to soar to over 50,000 vehicles on the road in just the next four years, a huge increase over the handful on the road today. And there has certainly been much debate in the industry about electric trucks. NACFI, through our guidance report series on electric trucks, has looked into some of the arguments for and against. We've heard from both the believers and the skeptics. And what we found is that the reality is likely somewhere in between. Um, but there are a lot of key trends really driving their popularity and, in fact, deployment. So we're going to hear today about a few of these this first being model availability is increasing. We've got some manufacturers and suppliers on the line who are gonna share what their companies have been up to. You can see on the right on this slide, the truck makers themselves are saying the future is electric. We know these vehicles are coming. We know this is the future. And we in fact see that uh, reflected in the market. 
On the left, you can see CalSTART Zero Emission Technology Inventory Tool, which is available online. And according to this tool, we expect over 85 electric truck models from over 30 companies to be available by the end of this year. We're also seeing growing political momentum to support zero emission vehicles. We're gonna hear from Kathy Kinsey later on the call about what Nescom has been up to in this MOU on the right side of the slide and also talk through some of the other policies that we've been seeing, uh, perhaps most notably the advanced clean trucks rule out of California on the left here. Notably, costs are continuing to fall, both for vehicles and for batteries, which tend to be the most expensive part of the electric truck. So on the left here, you can see the falling price of batteries over the last decade, over 90%, I believe. Um, and a huge fall, even just year to year, experts expect that to continue. And so as battery prices fall, we expect the truck builders to be able to offer these vehicles at lower and lower costs. And while there are still some uncertainties around what all of the exact costs for electric truck operations are, uh, as you can see on the right, the more we learn about electric trucks, the more we're finding a lot of these unknowns may actually end up in favor of electric trucks. And I, we also can't forget that charging infrastructure, which really didn't exist for these vehicles just a few years ago, is now being built out at an unprecedented rate. And we're seeing support at the policy and regulatory level. Um, states like California and New York in particular really taking the lead and putting into place um, some make ready infrastructure programs, which we'll talk about more on a charging electric truck boot camp session. Um, but really seeing leadership here on the utility side as well. And so with that, I think you're all here really to hear from our speakers. I feel so blessed to be joined by this handful of subject matter experts today. We will be hearing from all five of these speakers here um, today about what is driving electric trucks and hearing a diversity of perspectives. And the first one to kick us off is we are going to hear from Matt Weta from Peterbilt about what exactly, um, how exactly truck builders like Peterbilt are thinking about electric trucks and what they've got coming up. So with that, Matt, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Jesse. Um, so at Peterbilt, we're very excited about electric trucks. Just recently on YouTube, if you search Peterbilt Pikes Peak, we did a Pikes Peak run with our 579 EV. And this is the first achievement or the first of all electric commercial truck to summit this historic grade. And so a really cool uh, achievement for a commercial size truck. I only wish we could have done it with a trailer. Unfortunately, the grade and the road is just a little too tight to accomplish that. Um, but really a, a pretty cool, cool deal that we've recently accomplished. Um, but beyond marketing videos and all the press releases, as Jesse mentioned, that are, are coming out in frequent uh, cadence right now, we have three fully battery electric models which are available for order today. We'll make customer deliveries inside of the year. Um, so the model 579 EV in short haul and drayage applications in particular, uh, the model 520 EV in the refuse segment in particular, and then the Model 220 EV in short haul and urban PND applications. When considering an EV, the first and probably most important thing to make sure is that you're suiting the vehicle's capabilities to an application which is well suited to an EV. Um, to begin with, I would not say that an EV is well suited for every job that's done with a diesel truck today, um, but in certain applications, not only are they well suited, but they may even be better already than a diesel vehicle at these jobs. And so this is a quick checklist which should help to focus your efforts and your applications to consider electrification. And so the first and probably most notable item to consider is generally, I would expect, especially in the heavy duty space, that EVs will be somewhat more range constrained than their diesel counterparts. 
So with the Model 220 EV, we're capable of about 200 miles of daily range or range between charges. With the Model 579, about 150 miles of range. And with the Model 520 in the demanding refuse application, about 150 miles. And so identifying applications with the shorter ranges is the, the most suitable to electrification. And the second item to, to pay attention to is weight. And so, again, as a generalization, I would expect that an EV is most often, if not always, going to be heavier than a diesel counterpart vehicle. Um, the degree to which this is true depends upon the size of the vehicle and the range of the vehicle. Um, but this weight impact can be in the two to as much as 6,000 pound range generally. Uh, depending on the class of the vehicle. So I spoke about two limitations or two things to ensure you're successful when considering an EV. Um, next is really something that's, I think, a, a pretty big strength or a positive for an EV. Um, an application with a stop-start heavy duty cycle is really an application where an EV's strengths can really shine in relationship to a diesel. So refuse is probably our best example of this. Um, some of our refuse customers will do a thousand stops a day, every 60 feet. They're replacing brake pads three and four times a year. And every time they do that, they're burning fuel to get up to speed and then wasting all that energy by braking. An electric vehicle is capable of regenerating that energy, putting it back into the batteries, and this both extends range and reduces your total cost of ownership on a dollars per mile basis. So applications which are most stop-start intensive are the applications where an EV can really shine in relationship to a diesel. And then lastly, I would focus on applications which we can plan to return home at night and install electrical and charging infrastructure to charge the vehicle. Next. Initially, from a purchase price perspective, EVs are typically more expensive than their diesel counterparts. However, these initial costs are offset over the life of the vehicle. So to really holistically consider an EV for an application, you must consider the total cost of ownership over the life of the vehicle. To help you do that, go to peterbilt.com and click on resources and visit our EV calculator. This is set up with a format very similar to the ATRI operational costs of trucking survey, which you may already be familiar with. You can input fuel and electricity prices, maintenance savings, energy cost savings, uh, potential grant funding opportunities, and then compare your operational cost over the life of the vehicle between electric and diesel fuel sources. The biggest and probably a uh, most interesting aspect of total cost of ownership in which you can expect to see improved cost as it relates EV to diesel is your energy cost per mile. And so there's several factors at play in what this looks like. Um, this is diesel price, electricity price. It can actually matter when you intend to charge your vehicle and um, also the application in which you put the vehicle in. But this gives you a little bit of a view of what the delta is between a diesel truck and an electric truck in terms of energy costs. So in the best examples, we might expect a diesel truck to burn about $300,000 of fuel over its life, and an EV can be as much as a quarter million dollars less expensive in terms of energy cost per mile. So the last thing is as you consider an electric truck, it's not just a truck that you quickly place into service. You must consider the application and ensure it's suitable for an EV, but also consider grant funding opportunities, a charger, which you will use on a daily basis to restore the energy in the vehicle, and also the electrical infrastructure required to charge that vehicle. And so at Peterbilt, we're focused on being able to bring all these pieces to the table to understand and evaluate this decision for our customers. Great.
Thank you so much, Matt. That was an excellent introduction into electric trucks and all that Peterbilt is up to. Next, we're going to hear from Kathy Kinsey from NESCOM about what's happening on the policy side. Well, thank you, Jesse, and uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, really great to be uh, part of this uh, kickoff boot camp uh, session. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, state public policy uh, and, you know, adoption of uh, state regulatory and market as well as market enabling public policy is uh, really going to be a big driver uh, of early market development here. A growing number of states across the country are now looking to truck and bus electrification to achieve climate goals, to improve air quality and public health and also to grow a cleaner, more sustainable economy. Next slide, Jesse. So there is a lot that states can do and actually should be doing uh, in the policy arena to support truck and bus electrification. So last July, 15 states uh, and the District of Columbia formed a coalition and signed a governor's memorandum of understanding uh, by which they committed to work together collaboratively to advance truck and bus electrification. The MOU set some uh, medium and heavy duty vehicle sales targets, 30% zero emission vehicle sales by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And it provides for a 2025 midterm review of those targets um, and the opportunity to make adjustments um, if any are necessary. The MOU directs development and implementation of a multi-state action plan, um, and it identifies uh, 11 key focus areas um, for a state action. And um, uh, lastly, and most importantly, I think, uh, it emphasizes the need to accelerate deployment of zero emission trucks uh, to benefit, to bring direct benefits to frontline communities, those communities that are located near ports and trucking distribution centers and highway corridors that are disproportionately impacted uh, by diesel truck and bus emissions. Next slide. So this is the uh, largest multi-state transportation electrification in this country to date, uh, initiative to date. Uh, the jurisdictions that signed on to the MOU last July account for nearly 50% of the nation's economy and 40% of the goods that are moved by truck across the country. And so this um, coalition has some real market power behind it. Next slide. So the action plan is going to be uh, developed by a multi-state BEV task force that was formed back in uh, 2013 for a very similar uh, transportation electrification initiative for the light duty vehicle sector. NESCOM uh, is leading the task force uh, and is facilitating uh, the development of the action plan. Uh, the MOU gives the task force the discretion to make action plan policy recommendations on a whole range of recommendations uh, in any subject area. It does highlight some very specific uh, types of measures for consideration, things like uh, obviously uh, purchase incentives and financing approaches, uh, interoperability, and importantly, uh, the utility role. I, I just wanna say a word about utilities because utilities are going to be integral to successful conversion of fleets. There's no question about it. Uh, I can't overemphasize uh, the importance of fleet utility partnership and coordination for grid uh, interconnection, for investment in charging infrastructure, um, development of new commercial rates that are designed for EV charging, uh, and so on. So utilities have a, a lot of experience uh, and can provide the kind of guidance and uh, technical services that fleets are going to need to make a successful uh, transition. Next slide. So since the MOU was announced um, in, in July, the task force has been focused on outreach to key stakeholder groups uh, and a lot of information gathering. Um, MJ Bradley and Associates uh, is facilitating a utility convening um, and uh, dialogue around uh, the scope of the utility role in truck and bus electrification. 
And um, in this convening, uh, utilities from all of the states that are participating in the MOU that have signed on are, uh, are um, con uh, participating in the utility convening. And um, the goal of this effort is to develop some uh, utility-related re recommendations uh, for the states for the action plan. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we are beginning an EJ engagement process with frontline EJ communities and advocates uh, to ensure that the action plan centers equity and that these communities uh, do share uh, equitably in the benefits of truck and bus uh, electrification. And then informational webinars. You know, there's a lot uh, to understand about this market. It's much more complex than the light duty vehicle mar market. And so to build knowledge on the part of the MOU states and also to just lay a, a, a good strong foundation for development of action plan recommendations, um, we've hosted a whole series of webinars on a range of, of topics um, from you know, utility issues uh, to unlocking private investment capital. And, and through these webinars, um, we've heard from industry experts, we've heard from utilities, we've heard from commercial fleets, We've heard from public fleets and transit agencies and school districts and startup companies that are demonstrating sort of innovative business models. Um, and the webinars have just been a, a great opportunity uh, for us and they have um, been really helpful to understand all the barriers, the challenges, and as well as the opportunities uh, for state action to support this market. A number of themes, um, next um, slide please. A number of themes have emerged both from the webinars and the research that we've been doing to um, plan uh, for the webinars. Um, and these are just some of the key takeaways um, on, on what's needed uh, to accelerate market growth. So policy alignment between uh, utility regulators and climate, uh, energy, and environmental uh, policymakers, uh, regional coordination on infrastructure deployment, point of sale uh, incentives for, uh, for vehicles, um, regulatory programs that monetize environmental benefits of zero emission vehicles like low, low carbon fuel standards, uh, stable funding for incentive programs, uh, suspension of the 12% federal excise tax for heavy duty trucks. Um, next slide. Um, innovative financing approaches, non-financial incentives, utility investment in make ready charging infrastructure and fleet services, commercial rate reform, uh, relaxation of vehicle weight restrictions. We heard Matt mention weight as a, as, as a big issue for, uh, for heavier trucks. Um, and that is certainly something that we and the, ta the task force will be looking at. Uh, these are by no means all of the important takeaways from the webinars and the, and the research that we've been doing and the conversations that we've been having with stakeholders. But they do give you a good sense of the kinds of uh, actions and uh, subject matter areas that the task force is going to be uh, looking at as they begin the development of the action uh, action plan. Uh, next slide. I think that was my last slide. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's so exciting to see all of this work happening at the state level. Yeah. <laughs> Up next, we are going to hear from Steve Slozinski from Dana who is going to talk to us about what Dana's up to and one of the segments where electric trucks make perhaps the most sense right now, the medium duty segment. Steve, over to you. Great, thanks, Jesse. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, jumping right into things, you know, what's really driving all the electric vehicle excitement, uh, specifically around medium duty vehicles? So if we look at this slide, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, regulations is what's really driving a lot of interest whether that's at the local level, the state level, national level, or even global requirements and regulations, which also includes some of the incentives that Kathy mentioned. On the upper right, uh, really sustainability and social re responsibility is driving much more green technology, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions is, is key in acceptance of electrified vehicles. And also total cost of ownership. So how can fleets actually justify the higher acquisition costs the operational costs with electric vehicles versus, uh, say, diesel vehicles. So can this work be performed more efficient, efficiently? And really, in medium-duty applications, in many cases, the answer is yes. And then lastly, uh, it's being accepted primarily because there's a modularity and systems integration activity. 
Many of the OEM customers have invested heavily in capital to build vehicles that the industry has really proven and accepted today. Uh, being able to provide a modular system to electrify those chassis is really driving need for a lot of these new electrified vehicles. Next slide. I guess there was a build slide in here, Jesse. <laughs> Next. Uh, also looking at uh, you know clean city initiatives, uh, low emission zones or zero emission zones. Uh, Kathy talked about uh, the U.S. states putting incentives forth for electrified vehicles. Uh, these zero emission cities and zones and actually 17 countries have targeted net zero vehicle emissions by 2050. So outside of uh, US, the U.S. environment, we're also seeing a lot of interest in electrifying vehicles to to clean the air. Next, question keeps coming up, uh, what is the right equation for employing electric vehicles in the US? Well, as Kathy mentioned, these 15 states and DC have accelerated adoption rates. So I would target these states initially because they're likely gonna have the incentives in place, the electric infrastructure in place to, uh, to power these electric vehicles going forward. So this is definitely a great start. As they mentioned, their target is to reach 100% uh, zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles and buses by 2050. Next slide. <clears throat> so what are the expected fleet benefits from going to electrified vehicles? First, I hear a lot of it, fleets interested in reducing maintenance costs. You think about the, there's no oil changes required with these battery electric vehicles. There's no emissions to maintain, diesel particulate filters to change. So reduced maintenance is high on their list of, uh, of benefits they hope to accomplish as well as achieving increased uptime. So using a battery electric vehicle with these proven industry chassis, as well as proven uh, drive components can also help increase the uptime. Now you realize charging infrastructure may take longer to actually uh, charge the batteries in the vehicle. So that can actually take away from uptime, but typically these vehicles are being charged in off hours, they're unattended charging effort. So uh, for first and second shift operation, uh, battery electric vehicles are really ideal to help increase uptime. And then in terms of reduced componentry, the vehicle chassis ends up being a lot less complex when you look at the mechanical components that are part of the system. Eliminate a lot of service components and reduce the amount of total components on the chassis system going forward. And then as Matt mentioned, there's a lower total cost of ownership equation. Now the incentives are nice to help offset some of the initial costs that Kathy brought up, but we have to look at the total life cycle cost of the vehicle. And many of these applications in medium duty specifically can certainly justify moving to battery electric, even without some of these uh, extensive uh, incentives that the governments are offering. Then there's also the quiet and smooth operation that uh, generally is, is, uh, is experienced with electric vehicles. So that's a, another feature of the, be the benefits that the uh, fleets gained from this as well as many fleets uh, you know like Dana are looking to improve their corporate image matter of fact Dana's decided to reduce its overall greenhouse gas production by over 50 percent by 2035 many companies are following suit and this is an opportunity for the fleets to certainly shine and step up to reduce greenhouse gas emissions the other one we see a lot of our driver retention uh, many drivers prefer the quietness and ride and handling acceleration of these electric vehicles as well. So driver retention plays a part in the winning equation as well, along with these meeting the environmental requirements. These are tough requirements to hit. We're going to have to reduce our greenhouse gas output. We're going to have to adopt electric vehicles more so than we ever have in the past. So meeting these requirements are very important for fleet customers moving forward. And then last but not least, really increasing the productivity of vehicles. As, as Matt mentioned, start and stop cycles can be actually improved by changing the acceleration rate. Uh, when you stop the vehicle, it actually can regen, recharge the batteries. So these start stop duty cycles are really key to increase productivity or package delivery uh, applications. Next slide. So focusing on medium duty e-propulsion systems. So you've probably heard there's different ways to propel these vehicles forward, eliminating the engine and transmission in many cases, we can actually replace that with a central drive motor and or transmission system. So globally for medium duty vehicles, we expect over time, roughly half the market to move towards a central drive propulsion system, 
or the other half moving towards what we call an e-axle where the electric motor is uh, combined with gearing in the axle system. In Europe, we expect predominantly used uh, central drive configurations where they have a central drive motor or geared solution. And then in North America, over time, we expect roughly half the market to move towards an e-axle and half the market to stay with a central drive uh, proven solution. Next slide. So this is an example of a full electric propulsion and integrated system chassis. What I'm showing here on the left is actually the most popular and proven central drive system where there's a, a electric motor driven by it into a drive shaft into a conventional axle system. But really besides the e-propulsion system, which most people tend to focus on first, we really need to focus on all the systems and including the software, the controls, and everything else on the vehicle that now needs to be electrified once that fan belt's gone from the internal combustion engine. So we're now electrifying the heating system, the air conditioning systems, there's electronic PTO systems, we have to install charging systems, electric hydraulic power steering systems, there's now high voltage junction boxes as well as 12 volt uh, fuse boxes, as well as the batteries and battery management system. Uh, you think about the batteries, the batteries is really the single most expensive and heaviest component in a battery electric vehicle. So the batteries uh, get paid a lot of attention to over time. But if you think about this system, what this vehicle really is, it's essentially a battery electric vehicle is a really a rolling chassis that efficiently and quietly delivers products and services with zero emissions. So that's what we're talking about today. Next slide. So the medium duty chassis can serve a variety of applications that we're used to in the commercial vehicle market. Uh, typically these uh, ideal solutions would be a, a, a one shift operation. They operate maybe 100 uh, or 80 miles a day, every day, day in and day out with a known route. And as Matt mentioned, these typically can go up to 200 miles a day. Start stop cycles are ideally suited for these because we can recharge the batteries for every uh, stopping cycle. Knowing the route is very important too, so that you can spec the vehicle with the right size battery pack, so you're not under specking or over specking the batteries, as I mentioned, are the most expensive and heaviest part of the battery electric vehicle. These medium duty chassis also tend to be upfit by a variety of different body types as well. In this example, you're seeing a, a beverage uh, body put on, a, uh, on this medium duty chassis. We're also seeing that driver acceptance is actually higher. Uh, the drivers uh, like the quietness of these vehicles, but they really need to operate the vehicle differently. Typically, they can operate these vehicles with one pedal operation. So they really use the accelerator pedal, and when they let off the accelerator, it actually engages the, the automatic braking system to recharge the batteries. Drivers also need to know now that you can't really drive around with the windows rolled down in the wintertime with the heater on because the, the heater would actually consume energy that you really want for the propulsion system, unlike an internal combustion engine where essentially it generates heat for free. So with that, that's the summary I have today. Excellent, thank you so much, Dean. It's really exciting to see all the technological developments and hear more about all of these benefits to fleets who are considering electric trucks, regardless of policy or not. And sure. up next, we are going to hear from Kelly Ferguson from the LA Clean Tech Incubator, or LACI, about an exciting pilot project they have going on in California. Kelly, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today for this first um, boot camp and excited also to share with you the work that the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator has been doing. Uh, around medium and heavy duty electrification of goods movement. Uh, for those not familiar with LACI, we're a nonprofit clean tech startup incubator based in LA. Uh, but over the last couple of years, we've really been diving into partnerships, policies, and pilots. Uh, if you can jump to the next slide, please. So one of the major partnerships that's really uh, driven the, the pilot work that we're doing is the Transportation Electrification Partnership. And so this is really targeting, uh, making uh, big leaps in accelerating the transition to zero emissions transportation with the eye towards the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games that will be in Los Angeles. 
as part of this, we have over 30 organizations teamed up from OEMs, utilities, uh, local governments, and others all working towards these goals. And in particular, as we look at goods movement, we have two areas of focus around medium duty last mile and heavy duty specifically focused on port drayage and shore haul. Uh, as part of this, we have roadmaps that have outlined how we expect to achieve our really ambitious goals. And in medium duty, we seek to uh, have 60% of medium duty delivery trucks electrified by 2028 in the region. And then on the heavy duty side, really targeting the major goods movement corridor coming out of the ports of LA and Long Beach, the I-710, and how we can really transition that to be one of the first or the first zero emissions goods movement corridors in the nation. We are, uh, we have identified a couple of pilots that we're targeting and deploying now that work to achieve these aims. Next slide, please. So the first one that has been, um, I think, previously mentioned by Kathy, uh, or at least was represented on her slide, is the Santa Monica Voluntary Zero Emissions Delivery Zone. This project has been in the works now for well over a year, but we recently launched it in February, and it's a one square mile area in Santa Monica that covers two of their primary commercial corridors, as well as uh, a dense residential area. And this really seeks to bring together a variety of last mile delivery solutions from the very small to medium duty to really um, explore different opportunities in a, basically an ecosystem pilot. And what we hope to do here is to provide a blueprint for other cities to be able to adopt other zero emission zones and we're looking forward to expansion projects in the LA region um, currently, as well as providing an opportunity to those uh, committed delivery companies to explore the operations of doing zero emissions in this type of pilot and how those lessons can be learned and then shared across their organizations. Right now we have about seven delivery companies participating in the project and looking forward to bringing on more in the coming months. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have several different types of technologies we're exploring, but one I'd like to highlight is um, an EV truck share. Uh, so this is an opportunity for uh, the committed delivery partners, but for also the local public to be able to rent electric vehicles. Uh, we have vehicles from the um, the companies that you see here, the, the OEMs and upfitters that are providing electric vehicles for this pilot, ranging from class three to class six. And so these vehicles will be made available on the fluid truck platform for rent um, for a variety of different time scales. And this is a really great opportunity. Um, this is one of the first public EV truck shares in the nation. And so it's really exciting to be able to test this model out since um, since a traditional procurement of electric vehicles doesn't work for every type of, of business. Next slide, please. And then moving over onto the heavy duty side, um, Kathy also talked a lot about uh, the frontline communities, EJ communities that um, really bear the brunt of a lot of the air emissions. And so at Lacey, one of the core focuses with our zero emissions work is to is targeting the 710 corridor, which is the corridor that connects basically the nation to the ports of LA and Long Beach. This accounts for approximately 36,000 uh, truck trips a day and only expected to vastly increase over time. Uh, it's, a, it's a very heavily polluted corridor with a lot of uh, congestion and traffic. And so we have been uh, working for quite a while to uh, develop coalitions and partnerships, as well as identifying funding to help support initiatives that will reduce the barriers to transportation and fleet electrification, as well as the infrastructure side. Next slide, please. And so through this effort, uh, we have been identifying a number of uh, properties that are prime for investment in terms of charging, charging depots that can be made available for public or private fleets. 
And this year, we're really aiming to secure the partnerships and the funding so that we can start deploying these infrastructure projects. As you can imagine, there are a number of different types of location, uh, locations that technologies could be deployed at and different types of charging um, uh, technologies will need to address the specific needs of those fleets. So certain things that we're looking at include private depots. This would be one where um, a single fleet accesses it. Collective depots where multiple fleets can access the site. Truck stops. This would be for shorter term charging and even mobile charging. As you can imagine, we're looking at things from kind of the slower charging, the overnight opportunity charging um, and fast charging, and then also supporting these types of deployments with um, what we call distributed energy resources. So that could be solar as well as batteries. And so this would enable um, peak demand to be addressed by renewable energy and also offset uh, charging costs. So these are all areas that we're looking at here, and I'm sure that um, in future of events in the, the boot camp, we'll be covering these types of, of charging um, uh, situations, but uh, happy to share these two pilots that we're looking at and encourage anybody who's interested in learning more uh, to contact us to uh, get more people involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to hear about all of these real world deployments, both on the vehicle side and the charging side, which we have heard repeatedly is vital to ensuring the success of electric trucks. Last but not least, we are going to hear from TJ Reed with Meritor about um, their take on electric trucks and particular how electric trucks are making their way even into the heavy duty sector. TJ, over to you. Great, thank you, and uh, good to be with everyone. Uh, certainly, I think I'll just kind of fill in some of the gaps and, and kind of uh, emphasize uh, some of the points that the, the panel's made, but go ahead to the next slide. But I think as uh, when you think about heavy duty trucks and over 70% of, of, of goods transported uh, in this country are, are, are uh, delivered by truck, I think as an industry, we aspire not only cleaner, quieter technology, but also too, these are business tools. So uh, I think Steve mentioned it, they have to have certainly a, a return on the investment for the fleet. They have a business to run and uh, certainly have to be more efficient. So uh, it's an interesting time in, in our industry. I, I think more will change in the next five to 10 years than in the last 30. And that's saying something because we've come a very long way as far as overall emission reduction, um, certainly the reliability, durability, of the heavy duty trucks that are produced today, as well as uh, the safety equipment. Um, so, so what's really changing right now? What's driving the discussion? So I, I think as uh, Jesse hit at the beginning, it's the inflection point on the technology, probably first and foremost, uh, power density and uh, cost reduction in battery technology. That's gonna spur really, I would say, uh, uh, the immediate adoption and give us uh, certainly the look that we need out the curb. The rest of the vehicle certainly uh, is uh, under significant development right now as well. And specifically for us here at Meritor, we're, we're taking 100 years of capability and know-how and drive axle technology and converting that into full elect, uh, electric powertrain. So uh, in, a, in an e-axle concept and really not only delivering zero emission technology, but also the performance and the support that our customers certainly demand and, and require to, to support their business. So I think we're at an inflection point here as an industry. We're really starting to exit the low volume prototype and, and get into a, 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 a production scenario, still low volume, but a significant step nonetheless. So go ahead to the next slide. So from what from our perspective, what's driving, and just to add some additional color to the group here on the drivers, certainly the regulatory aspect is key as we build on our greenhouse gas roadmap. Um, you know, I think as Kathy had mentioned, certainly a specific ZEV uh, regulation that's coming in the MOUs. Uh, but I, I, I would say as well that uh, I, I don't believe that industry is uh, is waiting on regulation. Certainly, as a good partner uh, with policy, you know, you see large corporations making significant, uh, I would say, targets for sustainability, changing how they approach uh, certainly not only their own operations, but when it comes to 
equipment, how they identify what they're going to source, how they source it. And that all, all the way carries down to uh, certainly the truck OEM suppliers, fleets, um, you name it, uh, where we've really started the process of retooling our business uh, for uh, cleaner technology as we all work to fight climate change. So not only just targets, but significant investment. I think that's going to help the adoption curve. But like any nascent technology, there are limitations. To me, they're more of growing pains, not things that cannot be overcome. It's more of uh, a problem that needs to be solved with innovation and time. And I think really two big factors that the group talked about and we'll see throughout this series uh, in regards to the boot camp infrastructure, number one, uh, certainly has to be ubiquitous for charging, um, cost effective and, and certainly predictable. Uh, that's gonna be critical. And then the equipment, the vehicles themselves in regards to heavy duty trucks, the technology has to stand on its own. So either from a performance on how the vehicle's operating, um, reliability, durability, as well as uh, the total cost of ownership. So as those things come online, certainly, uh, you know, my, my view is adoption will continue to accelerate. But, but as we know, and, and the group mentioned, there is no silver bullet uh, for the myriad of applications that uh, that we need to tackle. So battery electric will have its place, certainly range extenders, um, potentially some hybrids in the near term, as well as uh, fuel cell when we're talking about long haul uh, and really the need for range um, and uh, faster uh, fueling cycle time. So, so again, I think all things that can be overcome with innovation and time, I'm encouraged by certainly not only the investment, the competition, I think Jesse had mentioned the number of, of new entrants into the market uh, paired with certainly traditional OEMs and suppliers, and uh, that's really, really driving the innovation that we're seeing today. So go ahead to the next slide. I think uh, just to highlight on a couple of things that Matt already covered when it comes to heavy-duty applications, there are two key beachhead segments that make a lot of sense, certainly on the drayage side. Uh, a short regional haul from a tractor. You see uh, certainly a view here of a Peterbilt 579 that Matt mentioned. This is uh, the vehicle that's going in production this year. Um, it features the Meritor 14XE uh, uh, tandem e-axle. And the benefit of that, as you see, certainly as it's packaged within the envelope of the existing suspension, that frees up a lot of real estate in the middle of the chassis for additional battery capacity, takes weight, uh, certainly out of the equation so the customer can translate that into additional battery capacity or payload. But in a drainage application, certainly we're, um, you know, short range, uh, have overnight ch charging capability, and then from the performance side, uh, high gross combination weights, and certainly with the, the, the power and torque capability of, of electric systems, uh, certainly that's a, it's a well-fit application. And then on the right-hand side, uh, refuse, again, Matt mentioned that uh, just by the duty cycle with thousands of brake applications per day, you're, you're certainly creating a bunch of regenerative braking energy that can be uh, repurposed in the system. Uh, I think an, another interesting aspect when you're talking about refuse or the vocational market, in this regard, the, the body itself will consume uh, almost or more than half of the energy uh, on the vehicle. So that's a, an added caveat that not only the chassis OEMs, but the uh, truck equipment manufacturers need to work hand in hand to innovate on how to manage the, the energy consumption on the overall pieces of equipment. So uh, a lot of work going on right now, and, and uh, I think we'll see continued announcements and progress there as well. And then for my last slide, really, uh, you know, I think I uh, just add a couple things on what the customer is expecting, and in, in, you know, in many cases, that always starts with the driver. Um, so, you know, our experience is the drivers adapt quickly uh, to an electric vehicle. So Steve had mentioned, uh, you know, one pedal application, you obviously have a, a different experience when it comes to uh, certainly the uh, instrumentation on the vehicle. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the immediate reaction is always uh, the performance. So acceleration, that immediate demand uh, for torque. And uh, so there's uh, certainly a, a an advantage for that in performance and, and a comfort level for the driver to be able to navigate through traffic, um, and especially uh, uh, when, when you ask for it, it'll, it'll give it, but uh, that has to be managed, right? So at the same time too, to make sure that there is a, a nice progression uh, on how the vehicle accelerates, also managing the energy consumption. So the driver is a big aspect of that and it's been uh, 
you know, tremendous feedback from, from drivers that we're interfacing with. They really like it. You know, I think as we talk about the quietness uh, of an operation on a battery electric vehicle, it's not silent. I mean, it's a different experience because you still have uh, tires that make noise, bodies that, uh, that to have uh, pieces of equipment that that uh, that also make noise, so it's uh, certainly much better than a diesel equivalent. But uh, the OEMs are also working on other ways to mitigate even noises that you didn't experience before. Uh, and probably the bottom line too is just uh, back to uptime. You know, being that heavy duty trucks are business tools, uptime is paramount. Reliability, durability, and, and what you're seeing across the industry um, certainly increased validation uh, testing at the component system and vehicle level and that's just going to translate into a superior experience when when these vehicles get into the end users hands and uh, they begin to uh, deploy into their fleets so again thanks for the opportunity and i'll hand it back in for uh, the q a thank you so much tj that was great we have heard a ton of great information. I'm confident whether you knew nothing about electric trucks coming into this or already knew a lot, there was definitely something for everyone. I also wanna note that our partners at ACT News have a resource on their website called the Buyer's Guide where you can learn more about a lot of these technologies. They have um, a ton of different companies listed, anyone involved with electric vehicles. So definitely check out that resource. We've got about 10 minutes left for Q&A, so I'm gonna go into some of the questions that we received in advance. The first one, I got a few questions about this, was really around this question of moving from pilots or demonstrations to full scale. Um, you know, When will these vehicles actually be available for purchase? Um, what are manufacturers' plans for commercialization? We've heard a little bit already today that some of these vehicles are in production already. Um, but Matt, maybe I'll start with you. Do you want to say a little more about uh, this moving to full-scale electrification? Yeah, sure. So as I said in my presentation, the Model 579, 520, and 220 are all available for production orders now. Uh, contact your dealer. They're built into our sales tool. We can quote permutations, PTOs, battery sizes, and range options. Um, all of that today and slate you in the schedule for, for deliveries later this year. Excellent. Anyone else, TJ, do you want to add anything to what you just covered? Yeah, just to add to it, I think you, as you see, uh, uh, certainly from uh, Peterbilt, Kenworth, uh, Daimler, Volvo, I think uh, not only the traditional OEMs, but uh, new entrants in the market are, are announcing uh, uh, series production, you know, over the next 18 months to two years. So exciting time. I think you mentioned 85 some new platforms. Um, I've also seen, I think, probably up to 120 shortly after that. So certainly a lot of offerings in the market. Great, thank you. I've also got a lot of questions here around operating climate, really wanting to know what do fleets or those working with electric trucks need to understand about vehicles that might be operating in extreme heat or cold? Again, we've touched on that a bit already, but does anyone wanna re-emphasize some of your points around hot or cold temperatures? I can take that, Jesse. You know, from, from my experience with uh, operating a battery electric vehicle every day, because I have one for my personal use, you, you do sacrifice some range in colder climates. The thing about batteries don't have the same energy capacity in cold, colder weather. So you're actually heating up the batteries, you know, consuming some energy or heating up the cabin. Hopefully the driver's got the window rolled up when that's happening. Uh, but you have to look at the whole duty cycle. So in, in climate, different climates, you have to look at the range capability and also specking the battery packs to be the right uh, size for the operation. Great, thank you. I've got some questions around challenges that you're seeing in the real world deployments. Um, maybe Kathy and Kelly, if you can take this, I'd love to hear, you know, Kathy, what you're hearing on the policy side in terms of challenges for electric vehicles. And then Kelly, same thing with these real world deployments. Um, what are you hearing from your participants? So maybe Kathy first. So uh, I think, you know, there are three big challenges uh, that, you know, from my perspective, I, others may think, you know, there are other major challenges that are more important, but I think financing is a big challenge um, uh, for fleets, um, you know, unlocking private capital investment to invest and finance the transition uh, is going to be critically important, especially for smaller fleets that don't have the capital resources 
um, that larger fleets do to make the kinds of investments um, that are going to be needed. And government incentive programs are really important. There is no question about it, and we're going to need them for some time. But everyone knows that they are not going to be the solution over the longer longer term. And, and we have to figure out how to best leverage public funding uh, to encourage private sector investment to support uh, the transition. Right now, there's just there are a lot of risks around electric vehicles from the financiers' perspective. You know, things like uncertainty around incentive programs, uncertainty about around battery life, um, uh, you know, uncertainties around residual value. All of those things, you know, are viewed by financiers as risks, which translates into either very expensive financing options or unwillingness you know, to really engage um, in the market. So this is um, an area where a lot of work um, needs to happen. Um, the other two things I would just mention briefly are um, funding for incentive programs. Um, you know, state budgets right now are uh, not in great shape uh, given, you know, the pandemic and, and other pressures on state governments. And, you know, there's a lot of certainty that is going to be needed to send a strong market signal around St stable and consistent incentive programs. And we need to figure out how, we as states are gonna need to figure out how to fund those programs uh, over a, you know, a, a, a period of time. And then lastly, I would just mention utility programs. I think um, that you know, a lot of the utilities around the country that are engaging in transportation electrification now are just getting started with their light duty vehicle programs. And that's, that's a heavy lift. Um, and there's maybe uh, some thinking that we have a long time to ramp up utility investment, um, but I don't think that's the case. And I think we really need to encourage public utility commissions and utilities to engage um, with their utility programs and make the kinds of investments, you know, and upgrades to the grid that are going to be needed for the longer Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Totally echo that. Kelly, anything you want to add in terms of what you're hearing from participants in the pilot? Sure, yeah, um, I would echo everything that Kathy said and then just kind of put a finer point or echo uh, the thing that we hear a lot when we're talking to delivery companies, um, particularly as it relates to uh, medium duty, but also um, heavy duty is just, you know, all operating models aren't the same, right? So not everybody owns their fleet. Um, some have independent contractors. So you need to have solutions that address both kind of these larger fleets, but then don't leave behind, um, you know, independent contractors and smaller fleets. And so that's why we've been really interested in the in the model that we're testing in uh, Santa Monica with the with the um, EV truck share. Uh, but there's there's others out there as well. And of course, key to that is. Kathy um, focused on was is to, is the financing how to unlock that so that more people can participate in the transition more quickly. Absolutely. And so one final question, Steve, I might toss this over to you. Just kind of wrapping that all up, I've gotten a lot of versions of you know if we're a fleet considering electric trucks, what beyond what we've covered here today do we need to do? What's our what's our next step? Well, I think the first step really is to, is to actually jump in. You need to really try electric vehicles to understand how it's going to impact your operation, how it's going to impact servicing, uh, how it'll impact uh, driver acceptance, how your customers like the new vehicle. So electrification is coming whether you like it or not. So I think it's time to embrace it and to put together a plan to slowly migrate to, uh, to electric vehicles in, in your operation. And again, for medium duty, it makes sense uh, in many applications right now. Well said, Steve. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, if you could go to the next slide. I just want to thank, first of all, all of our wonderful presenters today for sharing your expertise. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining. Please provide feedback via this quick survey. They've just put a link in the chat for you to take. As I mentioned earlier, there are 10 of these sessions in total between now and August, so please let us know what you'd like to see more or less of. I will also encourage you to go on runless.com if you want to test your knowledge of all of this great content covered today and work toward earning your electric truck badge that you can share with your networks. And then just a final reminder that our next training will be two weeks from today, same time, same place. Uh, so May 4th, and we'll be covering charging, planning, and build out. Thank you again to everyone. We hope to see you in a couple of weeks.